Hey, YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Today's guest is Richard Reeves. He's a scholar at the Brookings Institution, and he's the author of a new book that's incredibly interesting, Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. If you are a Breaking Points watcher slash listener, you may have noticed that Sagar and Krista did a 20-minute interview of him last week. So if you'd like the full extended version of this conversation, this is going to be right up your alley. Hope you all enjoy it. Richard Reeves, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you for having me on, Marshall. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Let's just start here. Could you set the table by giving us your central argument in Of Boys and Men? Yeah, the, the main argument is that following many of the social, cultural, and economic changes of, of recent decades, there are now some areas where it's quite right to worry about boys and men in terms of gender inequality, which is a weird thing to say. We're so used to thinking of gender inequality running one way. But in areas like education and work and family life, there are reasons to worry now about boys and men. And we can perhaps dig into some of those specific areas in this conversation. But but I think that the trend lines are troubling enough, especially for working class boys and men and black boys and men, to warrant specific attention on, on their problems. And very often not despite being boys and men, but in many cases because they're boys and men. Uh, and that's a that's a, a very very new thought, given the history that we've had around gender inequality. But the I think the facts to some extent speak for themselves, and I think we have a maybe not a political responsibility, but a cultural responsibility to be attentive to the problems of all groups in society, and even if it feels odd, to now turn our attention to some of the problems uh, faced by boys and men. That's interesting that you separate political responsibility from cultural responsibility. Because if I'm mm. thinking of the broad way you describe your work, you're you're a scholar who studies the idea of equality of opportunity and how that breaks down across mm. our society. Wouldn't you argue, though, that we have a political responsibility to ensure that groups have that equal opportunity? Yeah, it's interesting. I <laughs> I do think I meant something by the distinction, but now you're inviting me to reflect on uh, what I meant by that. And I suppose in some ways it's a, a bit of a mark of pessimism on my part about how whether politics is actually meeting some of its cultural responsibilities. But I think there's a role for politics and particularly policy. I'm a, I'm a policy wonk. So yeah. uh, right I think <laughs> policy matters I want us to have good policies and I and I and the the book is I'm proud to say pretty full of policy solutions right, rather than just lamentations but I think it's not just about politics and too often we place the responsibility for culture change onto the shoulders of politicians and because they're culture warriors, quite often, it sort of feels like a good fit. But when it comes to how do we talk about masculinity? How do we raise our sons? How do we think about our institutions? Actually, that there are there are no policies for those. There, there, are, there is no set of policies that can create the new script for mature masculinity that I think we need. There are policies that can support it, and we need politicians that can lead it. But I do think that this is a societal issue and one that we can't just delegate to policymakers. I think that's what I was getting at with the distinction. I, I don't want to let politicians off the hook, but I also don't want to let us off the hook in terms of what we're doing in our communities and our families on this front. Yeah. And having read the book, I think the way I'd articulate what you're putting out here is this is one of those weird policy political areas where there are specific individual choices because this relates to family, how you raise your children, where this could be implemented. So for example, my younger brother, he is born in June, You know, grew up in the early mm -hmm. 90s. There was a debate that my parents had where they're like, hey, we could have him be in the tail end of his grade, or because it's June, we could have him wait he'll mature a bit and he'd start school with that next September grade instead. That's a way that you could think of the mix of there's a cultural choice that you could really think about there. Like how would you how would you think about that distinction? Yes, that's a that's a great way to operationalize it because you could have a policy that says boys and I propose this, boys start school a year later than girls because they develop more slowly than girls, especially in in adolescence and and especially those summer born uh, children like your brother and like like me actually. Uh, 
but it's also something that doesn't necessarily have to happen through a kind of blunt instrument of policy. It could happen through a cultural change, and and it is happening. I did some reporting on this for the Atlantic, and found that in private schools, it's pretty common to effectively have different cutoff dates for school entry for boys and girls, uh, and especially for those younger boys, it's very often the school suggesting that they they start later. And so that isn't a change of policy even at school level. What it is is just a cultural recognition. The everything else equal, let's let's treat boys a bit differently to girls here on the grounds of equity properly defined, given that they develop somewhat differently. And and parents can have those conversations too. Uh, and also there's a there's a responsibility not to make it weird to start school early, for it to be okay. Like, there's a lot of stigma that can attach to certain things. And it's important that, that we have the cultural shifts that support policy changes that sense policy and culture feed off each other policy can help drive culture change but quite often policies will fail if they're not accompanied by a, an accommodating culture so i'm curious then because as I'm, I'm as i'm listening to the book i did the audible version which is really well done i'm thinking about your theory of change here because for example let's talk about a policy start boys in school a year later than girls as you know no doubt the united states is one of the most complicated schooling systems in the you know developed oecd world because there are individual school districts and there are states there's not just one federal policy you couldn't have let's say the biden administration or the trump administration say hey this is the new policy that we're implementing. So how do you think of change when you write a book like this? Is the purpose to get in the head of, let's say, a school board member to think, hey, maybe we should think about, how do you think about that? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a really a really great question. Um, uh, and I, I, my media trainer, let's sort of reveal about, about, said, don't say something's a really great question, unless it's a really great question, because it's usually just a way to buy time. But that was a really great, that <laughs> was you. a really great question. I'm thinking about it. And, and also, thank you for your comments about the the uh, the book. I actually read the book myself. Um, and I, I have this weird experience where you always have to audition for the role of reading your own book. Uh, and I said, and I, I say, well, what if, what if I don't get the role? And so we'll just find some out of work British actor to do it. <laughs> so um, yeah, I do think something like that's a, that's a great example. And there could be other examples too. So I talk about the need for equal paternity and maternity leave, and and I think that could be a parallel because you say, well, a company could do that. You don't need it, or a state could do that, or a city, or a government could. There's different levels at which these changes can take place, or indeed a family might almost decide to do that for themselves. And I am hearing from a lot of school districts, school superintendents who are like, we have a big gender gap. We are really worried about our boys and we're super interested in this idea. And there are in fact some where there's something similar, where there's like a second pre-K class that's not exclusively for boys, but disproportionately for boys. So there are, there are people experimenting with this. And I think with something like a policy change along these lines, some small scale pilots, some evaluations is a good idea. And also, frankly, to do it where you think the, the gaps are biggest, like where is the problem greatest? And so I am interested, and I'm doing some work on this now to look at where are the school districts, where are the schools where it really does seem boys are struggling the most. And those might be the places that you might want to try something like a delayed start for boys first, but then with some careful evaluation along the way. The truth is that although I'm in favor of this idea, I'm not I'm not so confident about how it'll work because we just don't have the evidence yet. That if, if President Biden were to call me just after this and say, I've got it, I'm passing a new federal law to you know, have a delayed start for boys, I'll be like, no, 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 wait, wait, Mr. President. Wait, wait, wait. Let's let's trial it a few places first. Let's evaluate it. That's interesting. I'm realizing as you're articulating this, that we really should probably separate out boys and men, girls and women, because we'll get into the, mm -hmm. let's say the things that could be controversial in this book here. I'd say the issues related to boys feel the least controversial. Yeah. Even like the, the, the conversation my parents had, like, you know, Portland, Oregon, liberal environmentalists, they're having that conversation in the 1990s, starting my little brother a little later, maybe or not. It's where the men come in and you start mm -hmm. talking about, well, the gender pay gap and how much is this structural versus personal responsibility? I think folks are not going to have that debate at all when it comes to a two or three year old. So just break down the differences mm -hmm. when you see the problems between boys and men, women and girls. 
Yeah, well, I think there's two things. One is there is just a, a framing issue here. I think just just generally, it, it's easier to think about the problems of children generally, boys and girls, as not the result of their own individual actions. Right? It's 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 harder to say it's it's individual responsibility. Whereas as soon as you start talking about adults, and this is true of men and women. It's just it's it's tougher to have a conversation where you're talking about structural causes. People start saying, "Well, if you're 27 and you haven't found a job and you haven't you know you haven't been able to settle, that's kind of on you, right?" You don't say that about a seven year old. Uh, so I do think there's that you're right that it's a, a more comfortable conversation generally. The second thing is that the the gaps are just so huge in education uh, in favor of girls. And then women, if we talk about college too, that it's just there's no controversy about that. Not necessarily that well known or talked about. I do think there's a role in just getting the facts out there because honestly, even I was startled to learn some of this stuff. I didn't know that girls had sort of gone past boys in math so strongly, uh, you know, in many places. Um, and so, and, and how far ahead they were in English. So even some of my priors were surprised by that. And then the other thing is, the third thing is that in the labor market, when we get to adults, it just is much more complicated. Right? So when you mm -hmm. talk about something like the gender pay gap or occupational status and so on, it gets quite difficult to tease out cause and effect. And the main reason we have this big gender pay gap is because women do more raising of children. It's really a parenting pay gap now. Um, but that's complicated. So you mean why versus, is that? versus a, let's say, Don Drapery, 1960s boss, saying, I'm going to pay you less, literally yes. because of your gender. That's the way to think yeah. about the issue in 2022 then. Y y correct. Uh, and, and and again, it's one of those areas where people's views haven't really caught up with the reality. Uh, most of the reason for the gender pay gap is not that kind of direct discrimination. I'm not saying there isn't any. Of course, it's illegal, and you'll pay a very heavy price for it legally if it's proved that you have actually paid a woman less for doing the same job uh, as a man. It's largely about the gender division of labor around child rearing. So women's wages track men's pretty well now through the through their through people's twenties. Um, and you hit around 30 on average, and then something happens to women's earnings. It's like a, if you look at the charts, you know, the chart, it goes up and up and up and up, and men's keep going up, and women's goes kaboom. It's like a meteorite has hit the uh, has hit the chart, essentially. And that's because women are just so much more likely to take time out of the labor market, um, to work part-time, et cetera, uh, because they're, they're caring for kids. Now, in some ways, that's for conservatives, that's the end of the argument. Right. Choices. Of course, They're deciding to yeah. leave the market and that's how it works. That's how it works. That's great. Uh, and for liberals, liberals don't even get to that point because they don't they don't like the moving on from discrimination point. But that's the beginning of the argument. It's not the end of it. It's the beginning. So why is that? A, why is there, is there such a big gender division of labor around child rearing? And B, does the trade off have to be quite as sharp? Do we have to make parents who are predominantly women pay? such a high economic price of raising their kids those are the really important questions and i think we can do two things one is we can have a more a more equal gender division of labor but secondly we can just reduce the price the parents pay that's really the conversation we should be having but the left too many people on the left are sort of stuck in the old discrimination model because that's more comfortable and too many on the right say, so, well as soon as you can prove that it's because moms are moms game over and every, so every, in a way no one's actually engaging with the real issue around the gender pay gap but for very different reasons Something I was thinking about, because I've also read your book, Dream Hoarders, is to what degree is this phenomenon of gender a zero-sum game? Because the key thing why I'm referencing Dream Hoarder is you're saying the upper middle class, to overly summarize a complicated book, mm -hmm. is hoarding opportunity is hoarding the dream. There's an advantage you get when you preference certain policy outcomes over other outcomes and that hurts other people. Is the scenario we're describing with women and men, girls, and boys, is there a is there a zero sumness to this? Does one side have to win at the expense of the other? Generally not. I mean, in my last book, Dream Hoarders, there were certain things I focused on, and the biggest one probably was something as basic as land you know, and housing, uh, and the way in which, in particular, the upper middle class zone neighborhoods uh, and hoard space, like literally physical space, in order to secure access to better schools, uh, 
tax breaks and so on. Um, and so why I'm such an enthusiastic Yimby, because I think the house the housing market has a lot to answer for in the US. And it is rigged by the upper middle class. So there's a bit of zero sum there. It's like you do have to actually change your land use regulations so that you can build more houses on that acre of land than you currently do. And that means that the person who currently has an acre of land and is surrounded by people with acres of land will lose something. And it's a bit similar with things like selective colleges. To the extent, if they don't expand, then yeah, if you're going to have more working class kids, that means you are going to have to have fewer upper middle class kids. And the same could be true of gender in those specific circumstances. But generally, one of the good things about most of the things we're really worried about is it's not zero sum. Mm -hmm. There's not much evidence, for example, that there's that the men's wages have dropped because women's have risen. Men's wages have, have dropped for reasons independent of why women's have risen. There is no reason why men's and women's wages can't both rise. And in terms of absolute numbers, there's no reason why we can't have more boys enrolling in college and doing better in college. And in fact, men enroll, but then they're much more likely to drop out. Right? That's not zero sum. A guy who starts college but doesn't finish <laughs> has not in some way been sort of squeezed out by the fact that the women are there too. So generally speaking, we can avoid those zero sum traps in most of the areas I'm talking about. And last example, say GPA, like there's a huge gap in in, gen, in, in high school GPA. <laughs> I don't need girls to do worse <laughs> in terms mm. of their GPA for boys to do better or high school. Gra I don't need fewer girls to graduate high school in order for more boys to graduate high school. And so generally speaking, uh, these are absolute problems and not relative ones. I've caught you on the second week of the press tour and of a book like this, that's particularly exciting because in the first chapter, you specifically write how you were nervous to engage with the subject. Friends and colleagues of your were like, be careful. This could prove controversial. What's your reaction to the reaction to your book at this stage in the game? Well, as you as you say, it's early days, Marshall. So give, ask me again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I would say the... One of the goals for the book was not just to create content, but to create space. There's a deliberate, you know, so I'm lifting, I'm just talking a little bit below the surface here about the book. It's like not just the book, but what's the what's the rhetorical strategy for the book almost. And, and my sense is that there are a lot of people who want to have this conversation, who are worried about many boys and men, but want to do so in a safe space. And that's particularly true on the center left. There's generally an appetite to talk about a lot of this stuff on the right and on the center right, but a reluctance on the center left and on the left, because there's a sense you're going to have to give up on other prior commitments around women, around gender inequality, traditionally understood. I've been pleasantly surprised so far by the thoughtful reception the book is getting across the board, but I'm particularly pleased that I am having good quality conversations with those on the center left. And obviously, there are lots of areas of disagreement, but it's getting a hearing uh, in many of the circles that I want to talk about. And that's true even just on a private level with some folks in, in Congress and in the administration and so on too. It's like, this has not been shut out. The fear with a book like this is that it gets shut down. And and actually, this is on the record. Uh, Congressman Ro Khanna, for example, ha has tweeted enthusiastically about the book. And I'm not sure I would have expected that out of the gate, but it's a good sign that thoughtful, progressive politicians are saying, yeah, there's something here that we need to talk about. I'm particularly curious about your reaction to the rights focus on this issue. This definitely didn't surface to your Twitter, but when your Atlantic excerpt came out, there was a bit of like discourse on right wing Twitter of this is how this game always goes. The right talks about an issue, it's ignored, but then the center left comes in with respectability politics and data and just operationalizes things that we already knew. Now, you have clear disagreements with the right's actual definition of the problem, the solutions, how we got here, where we went from there. Could you talk about like the points of agreement? Actually, just characterize what you see as the right discourse on this issue before you wrote this book and where you maybe agree and then part ways. Yeah. So I I hope that I'm fair uh, to all, all sides on this issue. I, I, I've been clear that I'm I'm happy to be getting uh to be getting some conversation, particularly on the center left. 
But I, you know, I'm really pleased by, you know, conservative friends, actually I'm friends with Scott Winship at AI and he's, he has a review coming out and it's, it's going to be one of the most substantively critical reviews that I've, we've seen so far, which is only a friend, of course, yeah. uh, can do that sometimes. But, um, I would say that conservatives, thoughtful conservatives have been worrying about many of the issues I lay out in the book for quite a long time. So I think it's fair to say that they've been doing so. Christina Hoff Summers, who's endorsed my book as a very well known conservative writer, she had, she wrote the book, you know, The War Against Boys in 2000. She then revised it in 2015. And so I think that some of the, some of the alarm bells have been ringing <clears throat> on the right. The problem is, and even Christina did this in her, her earlier work, is there's a sense of we have to go back to go forward. A lot of conservatives were warning in the 1970s that if, if feminism succeeded and women achieved economic independence, that would be very bad news for men and therefore for society. They anticipated that breaking the chains of dependency between women and men would have profound and, in their view, negative social consequences. Now, they were largely wrong about their, the pessimism with, with which they predicted what would happen, but they were right to say that this is a, this is a profound revolution. This is a huge change in human history. Because we've had 10,000 years or however many, however you want to count it, where we basically bound women to men through chains of economic dependency. And the women's movement quite correctly identified those chains and broke them. Still more work to do, but in advanced economies, it's done a huge amount uh, of work. And so what that does mean is that the question of what about the men, what are men for, is not just a joke anymore. Uh, it's a real question. Uh, and so they were right about that. The pro what they're profoundly wrong about is thinking we can turn back the clock or that we would want to turn back the clock. So they come up empty handed when it comes to solutions to go forward, because going forward does mean moving beyond the traditional family form. It means forming new cultural institutions. And so you know, the way I characterize this as I think about it is that if the left are guilty of turning their back, on the problems of boys and men, the right are guilty of wanting to turn back the clock on women and girls. And, and neither of those are very helpful right now. And to be precise then, when you say turning back the clock, do you basically mean overemphasizing debates in the 70s about feminism when it comes to this issue? Is that how you would articulate that? Because I think most, I think a lot of like right-wingers I know would say, no, like we're not we're not crazy. We're not trying to say you go back to the 1950s. That can't come back, come about at a variety of levels. But so what are you precisely, what are they proposing when you say turn back the clock? So the main thing they, that they're proposing is to restore traditional marriage. And what that means in their telling, and there are, there are many conservatives who would argue this, is that the only way effectively to give men a pro-social role in raising children, being a product, is through the institution of marriage. And so the decline in marriage, particularly for working class men, um, uh, is, is devastating. Uh, without, unless their husbands, they're toast, they're benched, right? It's husband or bench is kind of the, the, the framing of it. Now, of course, I'm simplifying it and they would be much more subtle about it than this, but it's like, okay, well, how's that going to happen exactly? How are you going to do this? And so you will get, like Josh Hawley gave a speech on men at the National Conservative, I guess the National Conservatism Conference. Yeah. It's like, all right. And he gave a speech. And I, I talk about his speech in the book where he said, boys and men are in, or a lot of boys and men are in trouble. That's because the left hate them and are against masculinity, so you should basically vote for me, and here's what I'll do for you. So the first is basically true. Lots of the similar problems, that there are lots of problems. The second can be made to sound plausible, i.e. the left hate you, because there are too many people on the left who just are either, or who are either just tone deaf on this or talk too much about toxic masculinity, and also don't talk about the positive things they are doing for men. So, for example, the infrastructure bill, 70% of the jobs from the infrastructure bill go to men almost all working class men and disproportionately working class men of color. You wouldn't know it from the way that that bill is being sold. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't occur to anybody to say, it's a good thing that that bill is creating you know, jobs for working class men. Um, that would not pass muster on, on the left. And so in, in that sense, they're their own worst enemy. So what does Hawley suggest? He says, bring back manufacturing jobs. Well, good luck with that, Senator. 
Um, and then a marriage bonus in the tax system. So it's bribing people through the tax system to get married, and that's going to magically reproduce this this social this system we used to have. And so the trouble is that they end up hand waving uh, and hand waving towards the past. So yes, you're right. So no, no, we don't want to go back. So okay, so what are you proposing then? A marriage bonus. Why are you proposing a marriage bonus? <laughs> well, because we want more marriage. Why do you want more marriage? Because we think marriage is good. But the nature of marriage has been fundamentally altered. And the conservatives have yet to accept that fact. So let's do a little thought experiment that comes to mind based on both the book, what you're saying here. Let's assume you never have a second, third wave uh, feminist movement. And the 1970s progress as they progress, aka mm-hmm. financialization of the American economy, um, the post-World War II period where the U.S. doesn't have to economically compete still ends because that has nothing to do with Betty Friedan, obviously. <laughs> and the jobs disappear <laughs> and the economy starts favoring certain styles of work over other styles of work. What do you think happens even without feminism? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like suggest I'm like, mm. I'm kind of saying this up in a, a way that suggests my opinion here, but it seems like the, it, it seems I'm just curious about how you think about that. Well, most of the things that have happened, as you've just listed, I think were were going to happen anyway, and they were going to they were going to affect disproportionately male jobs in various ways. I mean, in terms of the labor market shocks we've seen from free trade and automation, uh, that if they were going to happen anyway, you know, regardless of as you say of, of the women's movement, then that was going to hit men pretty hard, disproportionately hit male jobs pretty hard. The only thing probably that's also happened is that to some extent, men were able to, and white men especially, were able to somewhat rig the labor market to give them disproportionate rewards. So by excluding women and by excluding uh, men of color, and the trade unions were as much part of this as employers, that probably did mean that men were able to earn a little bit more than they uh, were able to in a more meritocratic economy. So to the extent that the, the women's movement, but also the civil rights movement more generally moved to a more meritocratic model of the labor market, that probably did take away at the margin some of the rents that less educated white men were able to get in the labor market. So a little bit. Um, but I would say by and large, the economic trends we've seen and the shift towards service sector jobs ex- and away from manufacturing, from heavy industry, they were going to happen anyway. And that is important because Sometimes the way that the employment stuff is talked about is when you talk about the fact that you know med- median male wages have dropped and median female wages have dropped by thirty three percent, male labor force participation's dropped, female labor force participation's gone up. Is that it? It creates a zero sum mm-hmm. mindset in people. Like it's really, and I'm, I'm really trying to get better at how I talk about this because it's like ah oh, ah right, men's wages have gone down because women's wages have gone up, and the answer is no 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 no, men's wages have gone down and women's wages have gone up, but largely, almost entirely for independent reasons. Um, And I think that some of the worst of our politics does play in, and again, on both sides, does play in a little bit to zero sum. Um, There are some people on the right who I think, well, yeah, of course, men are earning less. It's because all these women have come in. (laughs) Um, But vice versa, I think there's, there's women, there are people on the left who kind of say, well, we actually need men to earn less so that women can earn more. Well, Generally speaking, that's not true and and a rather depressing way to think about the labor market. And something I'm realizing is we actually defined really precisely, or you did at least, how the labor market is disadvantaged in the favor of women because of the the cratering uh, of, of earning power that happens after 30. Could you be precise mm. about how the education system as it's currently constructed and with the current set of economic and like broader societal conditions, how it doesn't favor boys. Yes. So the, the the analogy is well put. I think I'd say somewhere that the the labor market is structured in, in favor of men and the education system is structured in favor of girls and young women. And both of those are problems that we should be addressing. So when it comes to education, there are three big things. One is that the education system treats girls and boys as if they develop at the same rates, uh, particularly in terms of their brain development. And that's not true. Girls actually develop earlier. So there's just a there's no no controversy about that, that just girls' brains develop a little bit early, especially in adolescence. So there is 
big difference in, in adolescence on average with overlapping distributions of course but but they that but they're not trivial um these differences that you see between boys and girls in terms of development and so what that means is that a 16 year old girl is just she's she's developed particularly the prefrontal cortex which is the bit of your brain that tells you to do your chemistry homework rather than going out partying right that makes you care about your gpa um and that just develops a little bit earlier in, in girls. So, and then if you structure education systems so that you make those years the critical ones for educational success, you've built in a structural advantage. And interestingly, that was always there. I mean, girls were doing better than boys in high school in the 60s when there was absolutely no incentive for them to do so, right? Um, because almost none of them were going to college. Uh, so that structural advantage has kind of always been there at the school level, but it was only when we took the breaks off women's educational opportunities and aspirations that we're actually able to see it emerge. so ironically it took the women's movement to expose this structural advantage in the education system so that's number one just timing number mm -hmm. two is that the education system is now increasingly female dominated in terms of teaching and it does look for reasons that are complex and only partly understood as if having teachers of the same sex is helpful to both sexes but we're now at 76 percent female in k-12 and rising the uh, number of men in teaching is dropping over time. And so it's more of a female environment. And that does, for role model reasons, ethos reasons, seem to matter. And then the third thing is that the education system is strongly structured and increasingly structured in quite narrow academic ways. So it is more about sort of, you know, that sort of academic style of learning. And it turns out that on average, boys boys benefit a bit more from more vocational, hands-on kind of learning. So the chronic underinvestment in the US education system in vocational education disproportionately hurts boys and men. Not it's not the it's not the intent, of course, but if we focus on college, 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 rather than say apprenticeships and technical, that is a way of actually continuing to structure the education system in ways that everything else equal tend to favor girls and young women. You know, something I'm curious about, I, I did a uh <laughs> I did a pre-question check with my uh fiance um to prevent any uh, uncomfortable questions that will get me in trouble. And then something she just, yeah, <laughs> after, when, 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 she, when she listens when she to the listens. episode. Yeah, yeah so, I know what and, you mean. Yeah. And, and something yeah. she, she brought up is this question of how, when we're evaluating like educational performance with men, like how much does it actually matter? So are we saying mm -hmm. boys have lower GPAs? boys don't quite get into college at the same rate. So like, to what degree do those statistics actually matter when translated into their like latter lives? Cause like not to overly personalize it, but I, I was a very mediocre student in high school and college, but obviously like I'm well read, I can conduct this conversation. There wasn't a tie between my like position and my class rank and my ability to be successful. Now we shouldn't make everything based of personal, but that's how I kind of think about that. Like to what degree are these GPA and like performance metrics when you're 14 do they actually matter? Yeah, that's a big question that is independent, really, of the one about gender. Actually, mm -hmm. that there's a big debate about how far they predict. You know, these things predict what happens, and the truth is that they do, on average. So, in aggregate, of mm -hmm. course, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Having a high school GPA, going to college, you know, on in aggregate, those things are good. They predict greater success, but there's then a huge amount of variation around around those means. Uh, and you're, you, you're probably a good example of that. And you know, my, my high school GPA or equivalent when I was 16 wasn't very good, but here I am and ended up managed to go to Oxford. So, um, there, it's certainly not the be all and end all, but I have noticed that the people who are most likely to say that we shouldn't worry too much about education are still the ones who've done pretty well educationally. Mm -hmm. you know, so, whereas a lot of, uh, those from working class backgrounds, boys in particular, they're not doing so well. So it depends like what level we're talking about. I'm just crunching some numbers by state. Uh, we haven't published this yet, but in Michigan, for example, the on-time high school graduation rate for black boys is 64%. So you've got just over one in three black boys who are either not graduating, or graduating really late, they're being held back. Yet. Now, does that matter? Uh, hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and I don't, and anyone who says it doesn't matter, I'm not going to take it seriously. Does it matter if you get high if you get higher education? Well, increasingly, it doesn't have to be a four year degree, but increasingly, some kind of post secondary qualification is highly predictive. Doesn't mean everyone needs one, but I think one thing is worth saying is that people say, well, men don't need as much education because there are plenty of 
there are plenty of decently paid jobs for men to do without education. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's that's historically true, but much less true today, and going to be much less true in the future. And so that's a backward-looking view. There aren't actually going to be as many jobs that where you can get a decent, a, a good living without education in the future. Here's what I wonder. Whenever I hear this argument, I, I understand that it's it's literally true. I guess what I wonder a layer deeper is how much of that is a social construction. Mm. So when we say, because look, I, you know, I went I went to University of Oregon, decent but not incredible state school. I think a lot of my peers are folks who would have been successful regardless of like what they specifically learned their junior year hmm. in that random econ class they took. So when they are successful, are we really truly saying that they are successful because they took that class? Or are we saying that our society has a so- social construction, aka the bachelor's or the bachelor's of science degree, and that then gives them success? I think that yeah. tends to that, that I guess I think we know this is definitely true for high school. That's not debatable. But I just I'm always kind of skeptical with the college angle. Yeah, I think I think you're right to be skeptical because there is a lot of evidence that the the people who go on to do well were going to do quite well anyway, like you and others. There's some very good studies which look, for example, at, at someone who got into a more selective college but then didn't go. Uh, and actually, one of my one of my son's friends is a great example of this. She wasn't in the study, but she got into two or three Ivy League colleges and decided she didn't want to pay, so she went to the University of Maryland instead. Um, the studies would show she's going to do as well as she would have done if she'd gone to one of the Ivy Leagues, right? Because she just like she'd selected anyway, right? She 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 was like, if you're good enough to get in, then you're going to succeed anyway. But even if you're not quite good enough to get in at the time, if you've got you've got your stuff about you. And you develop later, then you'll probably be okay. So again, we're talking averages. Yeah, I, I, I think though that there's a there's a danger on the other side. So there's a danger of overemphasizing educational qualifications and credentialing for sure. And Byron August and his work on this, I think, is really as he runs Opportunity at Work. He talks about the overemphasis on these credentials. So mm-hmm. everything else equal, if we could reduce the way in which those credentials are used, very often artificial barriers. That would be good for everyone, but it'd be particularly good for for boys mm-hmm. uh, and, and men from from tougher backgrounds. That said, I don't think we should assume that the use of education as a way to select people into jobs is going to go at any time soon. And I don't want to let up on it until and unless we have actually had these social changes. So yes, <laughs> sure, let's have those social changes. But th- the same conversation comes up in terms of class, by the way. So you know, when I was writing my last book, a lot of upper middle class people were saying, well, not everyone needs a college degree. And then I would say, okay, did you have you got a college degree? Have all your kids got college degrees? Okay, come back to me when not everybody you know has a college degree. Right when you're when you're not talking about which postgraduate degree your own kids are going to get, then we'll have a conversation about college is not for everyone. Because when people say college is not for everyone, they never mean themselves or their own kids. They always mean other people's kids. And so I don't want to back off the importance of education. That said, I do think that when we talk about education, we shouldn't just be obsessed with four-year degrees. We should be talking about you know, associate's degrees. We should be talking about vocational, et cetera. One of the reasons why male college enrollment cratered in the in the pandemic was because men were more likely to be doing like hands-on learning in community colleges. Mm-hmm. And there's very good evidence that kind of good quality associate's degrees uh, in in needed professions like electrician, plumbing, HVAC, you know, those are, those are kind of stereotypical examples, but true that they can lead to pretty good earnings and pretty good outcomes without a four-year degree. And so the, the, the between high school and the four-year degree is where a lot of the action is and also where a lot of men could really be helped. You know, to argue against myself as you articulate this, I'm realizing that a huge issue that you're describing is like men dropping out of higher education in the first place. Mm. And that, you know, comes with debt, that comes with not attaining the education, the, the even the credentialist benefits. So it's somewhat academic to say, well, is this degree truly important? Because it's clearly important. We see this in the data. Therefore, what is a way you think to get to the solution side of the question? And I actually think that this is one of the more helpful solution sections, because this is something that higher education administrators state 
states themselves actually have a lot of input into these dynamics. This is probably the most implementable of all of the implementable parts. How would you make college something where you have a higher male graduation or completion rate? Yes, yes, great, great correction there, because you're quite right to say that a big part of this is a completion crisis as much as an enrollment crisis. Uh, and when you look at why uh, boys and men end, uh, don't end up with such high levels of degrees, it's it's at least as much completion as it is enrollment, right? So to just put a data point on it, you see about a 10 percentage point gender gap in college enrollment, but then a 10 percentage point gap in how many of those who, who enroll graduate on time. So it's, it's both. Uh, and in, in some ways, I think this kind of, and in community colleges, the, the dropout or stopout rate is very high. So stopping out, being take a year out, come back, zigzag in and out a little bit. So one thing we can do, of course, is to try and really work on K-12, which we've already talked a bit about, you know, more male teachers, et cetera. I would argue for a delayed start. But in colleges, I think that the way, the emphasis that we've had so far on helping women in college through Title IX and so on has been absolutely correct and laudable, but we now need male-specific educational interventions. I think the University of Oregon is the only university to have a men's center. Nice. <laughs> Specifically, I, need I did to be not, I did not check out that. this men's center. So I'm just I sort of think <laughs> I need to be I need to be fact checked on that. But yeah. but uh, to help and uh, to men. Uh, with some of their with some of their learning and so on too but also the mentoring programs that we have in colleges again having men to to lead those be mentors etc uh to actually have some male specific interventions uh, would be hugely helpful to colleges and especially men from less advantaged backgrounds so that's going to vary in terms of how it looks and as I mentioned a men's center but actually i think you could have like academic men's centers around the country again you, this sounds crazy until you look at the numbers of men who are really struggling at college uh and i think we're seeing some moves in that direction if i'm a and i i know that a lot of college presidents are really worried about this but they need a bit more permission space to be able to engage with it as a real problem you know in these last 10 minutes i want to bring up something that really stuck out at me um in the book you pointed out um, I want to find, I can't find the exact quote, but you, you essentially said a lot of the solutions we have or the approaches we have right now, whether it's reduced tuition, scholarships, et cetera, they actually tend to, especially when we're talking about like working class and poor people, they actually tend to work better for women or girls than boys. And the, and the anecdote that that immediately came to like, and this is actually, I want to speak up for your book real quick, not that that needs to be done. Th this did a great job of helping me put together anecdotes and narratives I've already seen. So if you ever noticed when you have like a Malcolm gladwell -y segment talking about how effective KIPP schools are, like knowledge is mm -hmm. power schools. These are charter schools that have earlier strike start times they're in session 11 out of um 12 months of the year instead of nine months and in the anecdotes of how successful these universe these these programs are it's always a young girl i'm thinking back to like i recently we read outliers for fun and it's talking about hey like this is a system where it intervenes with like young young predominantly like black persons of color and every single anecdote is a young girl and I'm mm. kind of like wondering when you're talking about how we've found ways to intervene and in ways in the most disadvantaged communities, how even in that context, it's still going to have that unbalanced like gender ratio. So can you just like kind of talk about this concept? I think that was the most like revelatory thing I encountered. Yes. Uh, I started by looking at some of the, the college interventions I actually ended up. I ended up going to Kalamazoo, Michigan, which was not, not not in my original research plan. But the reason for that is a free college program there, the Kalamazoo Promise, which pays full tuition for the kids graduating from the high schools there. And, and it's unusually generous and very unusual that it's been properly evaluated by a, a strong team of scholars from the Upjohn Institute. And what they found was it hugely lifted, like 50% increase in female college completion, and it had zero impact on male college completion. So there you've got this completely free, full tuition, incredibly gentle to any college in the state, essentially. And it didn't move the needle at all. 
Um, and then you look and you find others, a mentoring scheme at a, a Texas college, a school choice scheme, actually urban boarding schools in Baltimore and DC, just kept coming across these interventions where they had some good overall outcomes. But then when you disaggregated, that was being driven by good outcomes for the girls and the women. Uh, rather than for the boys and the men. Of course, there are exceptions. So there's been a good pro- Boston pre-K study that's just come out, which did seem to work better for boys than than girls. And vocational interventions, as I've already mentioned, seem to work better for boys and girls. But generally speaking, there's a whole raft of educational interventions that just seem to get more response from women and girls. And it's a it's something of a mystery as to why the incentives for boys to do well should still be strong, at least in terms of the economy, which we just talked about a moment ago. And so it does seem to be more about identity or motivation. So that's when I went to Kalamazoo and I was talking to all these guys and they'd, some of them had dropped out of college to help a friend, had gone back, they'd had an idea for this, they'd, they'd changed course a lot, whereas the women are just much more linear. And, and I think it speaks to almost where we started about the cultural problems that underlie a lot of these policy dilemmas and these trends. So here's the numbers, here's my evaluation. So here's all the wonky brooking stuff. But what I got from these guys in Kalamazoo, this guy Tyrese who really made an impression on me, was that we don't have a strong script for men now about why they should stay on these tracks. We do for young women, which is you need to become economically, get educated, you go girl, you make sure you can stand on your own feet, et cetera, right? A hugely powerful script that surrounds young women, uh, girls and young women. What's the one for guys? Uh, there isn't one. We've we've torn up the old one, <laughs> which was the dad's one. Like you're going to be a breadwinner. You're going to have to look after a family. Ah, well, I'm, that's not necessarily true anymore. And so I think, absent a strong script, uh, it is easier for guys to get knocked off course, to zigzag out, to stop out, drop out. And there's a sense of like drift, checking out. It's not that men are generally acting out. There are, of course, rare exceptions. That's much more that they're checking out. And so it is it's just, it's kind of hard. Guys are improvising a bit. They're struggling a little bit. And, and if I'm being completely candid about this, you can't capture all that in these numbers. Mm-hmm. Underneath, like, why wouldn't these interventions work as well for boys and men? There has to be some cultural stuff there too. And so I end up saying, look, we need anthropologists as much as we need economists, if we're to understand what's happening with boys and men in the US today. But that conversation is only possible once we accept that there's something to talk about. So for the last two questions here, the first one would be, um, I was taken with your point that if President Biden called you and said, I'm going to, let's assume we have a slightly different federal structure, I'm going to implement <laughs> one hour later start times across the country, you'd say, no, like we, we need experiments. What is the, if if we've opened the conversation with this book and hopefully this conversation to a certain degree, what are the immediate next steps that folks at every level of our society should be taking? Like, where, where's the next bit of work to be done? Well, there's a lot. I would say things like uh, if the president were to call me and say, what do you think about this apprenticeship bill that's sitting in the Senate, been there for a year now to create a million new apprenticeships? Go for it. And the fact that nine out of 10 apprentices are men, don't worry about it, right? It's been sitting fallow for a year. Um, so I would vocational training, I've, I call for the create ten, create a thousand new technical high schools. Just do that. Right? I'm very confident about that. If you have a paid leave policy come up again, make sure it's equal. Finland just did this, equal for fathers and mothers. Give fathers equal rights to paid leave uh, as to mothers. Uh, And so some of the things I think we kind of know we should be doing, and the last thing, which we didn't really touch on, but I would say straight away is concerted investments in getting more men into the growing jobs in what I call the heel professions, health, education, administration, and literacy. Like, Like right now, I would be happily spend significant amounts of political capital and money on getting, for example, more men into the teaching profession. The fact that we're just seeing fewer and fewer men in our classrooms over time and not doing anything about it is shocking. I think male-only scholarships to get men into, particularly early years teaching, are entirely justified. I would do that right now. <laughs> so there's a bunch of stuff where I feel very confident. Like, like, Of course, you'd evaluate them. Of course, you'd have time limits on them too. But I would absolutely go for some of those things right now. 
And to wrap, I know every scholar has a bias on this question, but I'm really interested in just how dissatisfied and discombobulated the U.S. feels right now. To what degree are these broad issues of inequality and a lack of equality specifically? What to what degree do you think these are center to what I'd say your diagnosis of the country would be right now? I think the the combination of growing class inequality and the real and the backwards trajectory of many men in the US is a non-trivial contributor to some of what we're seeing in our society. When you have a situation where, as I alluded to, I think at the beginning, most men in the US today earn less than most men did in 1979, when actually you've seen a slight downwards move, that's those are salient economic facts, uh, which are hugely important to our politics right now. It is not a coincidence that Donald Trump won in 2016 with the biggest gender gap in recorded polling history. It is not a coincidence that the right are picking up a lot of working class men, and in, not just white working class men anymore either. They are picking up some more working class men from, uh, particularly from the Lat from Latino communities and so on too. And even black, you saw a slight increase in the number of black men voting for Donald Trump. Still low, but from uh, 2016 to 2020. And so I think some of the things we've, we've been talking about here, some of these really swirling cultural and social changes, but also just some of these hard facts about what's happened to working class Americans over the last few decades are definitely fueling some of what we've seen. This is obviously not an original thought. What's missing from the analysis sometimes here is there's a gender aspect to it too. And you're seeing uh, opportunist politicians on the right exploiting some of what are genuine problems of boys and men, but to what I would say are largely negative ends. But that's made much easier if on those very same issues, there's nothing but deafening silence from the center and the center left. So there is a huge political opportunity here as well as a political responsibility to directly address these issues. Because uh, uh, as I say somewhere in the book, it's an axiom of politics that if, and I'm quoting uh, I'm quoting someone here, Daniel Schromenthal, I think, uh, it's an axiom of politics that if responsible people don't deal with problems, irresponsible people will exploit them. And if you, if you think there are real problems with boys and men, and I obviously do because I've just written a whole book about it, then we have a responsibility to address them. And if we don't, we really shouldn't be surprised if we just create a big political market for somebody else to come into. Richard, very well said. Thank you so much for joining me on The Realignment. Thank you for having me on, Marshall. I appreciate it.